Hi, I'm Dion Beebe, uh, Director of Photography on The Little Mermaid, and this is The Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Dion Beebe, the cinematographer of The Little Mermaid. So I'm sure you all know, but there is a live action Little Mermaid out, and people are loving it. Um, I really enjoy my interview with Dion Beebe. I mean, he is just such a legendary cinematographer. Check out his IMDb. He's done a million films. Um, and Little Mermaid is just his most recent. And he does a really good job of explaining you know, how he lit and, fit and shot the underwater world versus the above water world, the challenges that go into it. We dive deep into all of those things, no pun intended. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Thank you to everybody that asked all of your questions, really good questions. And I'm pretty sure we covered basically all of them on the show. So thank you all so much for that. Uh, but yeah, let's just, once again, dive in to the interview with Dion Beebe, the cinematographer of The Little Mermaid. I want to welcome Dion Beebe, ACS, ASC, to Go Creative Show for the first time. Thank you so much. What hey. took you so long? <laughs> I don't know. I was waiting for your call. I mean, sitting there by the phone, like, come on, call me. <laughs> of course, director and photographer of just countless movies, but we're here today to talk about The Little Mermaid and anything else that may pop up. I mm -hmm. really enjoyed this film. Uh, and I have to say, too, I was mentioning on my social, I'm like, my producer, Connor, is a is a huge Disney fan. I myself, like, I mean, who doesn't like Disney, obviously? But, like, there's that that second level of Disney fandom that I'm yeah. not a member of. I will never claim to be. But yeah. it's seeming, though, you you guys and what you did here with The Little Mermaid is really working for people like me, casual Disney fans, but also yeah. the really true hardcore fans of Disney. Are you feeling the same way? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think, you know, Taking this on was a, was a little bit daunting because it is such a sort of beloved title um, under the sort of you know Disney sort of banner and and yes there's there's the super fans you know there's people who you know this the animation the original was was such a sort of important part of their childhood or whatever aspect whatever attachment they have it's it's deep and look I've met Ariels you know in their twenties you know who were you know, named after after our sort of Ariel in the movie and have sort of grown up, you know, you, you sort of have to remember this. It's like, what is it, 86 or 7 that the original came out? So, you know, that's quite a few years ago now. Um, so, yeah, no, look, it, it was, look, it was exciting to, to try and sort of figure out how to bring the story to sort of essentially to life. Um, but it, it was also, you know, with a sort of a fantastic partner in, in Rob Marshall, who we have a history together. And I think we, you know, we very much sort of went in, sort of collaborated on this thing and, and, and spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we were going to do it. Well, what was the thought process? So, you know, there's this legacy of the film. It's obviously started as an animated film, The Little Mermaid, back in the 80s. So... Coming into it now, how inspired were you by the animated feature? Uh, look, you know, w without question, you know, we we watch the animation. You know, um, it, it's tricky because you know, bringing an animation to life it is, you know, we very much, you know, felt we needed to sort of pay homage to that to to those sort of fans of the original animation, um, but. It's also a different process. You know, the live action aspect is different. You know, the character is going to be a little bit different. The world is going to be different because you're not in the sort of, you know, animated world, the sort of um, cartoon aspect to the sort of dimensions of, of character and, and of sets of place. Um, so sort of filling it out and sort of giving it the depth that needed um, was, you know, there was a lot of discussion about that, but always keeping in mind, you know, the the original. Um, so, yes, we watched it, but we, we really did not um, try and sort of do any sort of frame-by-frame frame sort of recreation other than, you know, there are a couple of um, moments that we really felt we sort of 
we we wanted to really hit, you know. And of course, you know, if you've seen it or not, or when you eventually see it, there are a couple of moments that, you know, you know, pretty much you could put side by side with the animation and sort of just experience that moment um, on the big on the big screen live as you did on the on the animation hopefully name one what's one of those moments where you were like you know what we nailed this uh, look i feel and it was a pretty exciting moment um when it's it's the sort of part of your world r reprise it's when um ariel after she saves prince eric lays him on the beach and they, the, the courtiers and the sort of from the palace come down and they find Eric on the beach. She escapes into the water and she's watching him um, on the beach. And she has the sort of what's sort of called sort of um, part of your world reprise. Um, and in the animation, it's, it's, um, it sort of crescendos with a wave crashing as she sings the big note at the end of that sequence of part of your world. And a wave crashes behind her. It's sort of dawn and and we spent a lot of time recreating that moment you know creating our own wave splash so we could time the exact moment as as Hallie hit that note we could the wave could crash behind her and she you know and it, it's it's a sort of you know it sort of brings sort of chills to to me thinking about it because you know her voice her performance at that moment and we did it in one shot so when you see the movie, it's she appears behind the rock. We sort of pull up, and it's in the water at sea, and we're sort of so we were on a crane out in the water, you know, on a close up on a zoom, pulling back as she climbs up and as she's singing the song, and then we widen out just as the wave hits, and you know, we reveal the sort of you know the setting, and yeah, it, it was a sort of exciting, exciting sort of moment to to recreate. I hadn't seen the film, honestly, since it was originally in theaters. So it was kind of a little bit all new to me. But that moment, I went with our producer, Connor. At that moment, I was like, the, it's like all of a sudden, the, the memories of the film flood back when you see right. that moment. So, I, I mean, whatever you, all the work, all the planning was well worth it <laughs> because it certainly <laughs> did have an impact on me. And I'm sure countless other people out there watching it. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that was the hope. I mean, it's, it's not that we're, you know, we were ever looking to sort of copy an, an aspect of it, but I think there's something in the original that just touched a lot of people in sort of hearts. And I think that moment is, is one of them, you know, and I think that moment as, and particularly as, look, as Hallie performs that song, you know, and, and, and brings a new life to it, um, it, it was really sort of satisfying to sort of bring the the two worlds together effectively yeah. now you and rob marshall have been noted in articles to have been inspired by blue planet for little mermaid i'd love to talk to you about that uh, you know i guess what inspired you from that show and how did you implement that inspiration into the film yeah you know look i i, I think look because the film is set you know half the movie is set underwater um we had to sort of figure out, you know, what our what our sort of under underwater world was going to look like, how people were going to function in that, how we were going to effectively do big musical numbers in this world. So there was a lot of discussion about sort of methodology and how we approach, you know, camera lighting, um, moving the actors, all of those elements, um, and to sort of bring them into um, – in, into our sort of live action version and blue planet. I mean, th there is some incredibly stunning sort of imagery, both about just the power of the ocean, you know, the world of the surface of the ocean, as well as just the sort of depth, you know, we spent a lot of time um, sort of studying, you know, how light affects color when, when you go at different depths and, <clears throat> and our movie sort of takes place, the elements that take place underwater take place at different depths underwater. So, you know, part of Ariel sort of, you know, where she hangs out with Scuttle and Flounder is near the surface. 
the world of, um, um, you know, with Triton and her sisters and the, and the world of Atlantica is in a sort of mid-level part of the ocean. Again, the light changes, the sort of, the, the sense of sort of particulates and the atmosphere effectively changes. And then when we go deeper into Ursula's world, Ursula's lair, which is near the bottom of the ocean, then, of course, you know, you sort of eradicate almost all the sort of red spectrum. And now you're into very blues, deep blues and almost purples. Um, so, you know, we were able to sort of look at something like Blue Planet and really study, um, you know, how a sort of real world um, is affected by, by these sort of depths and ideas. And then really sort of put together our own sort of playbook in terms of how we were going to sort of realize that. Because some of, you know, what happens when you go deep, it, it gets very hard to see. There's very little light cuts through and it becomes, you know, incredibly sort of, you know, murky and, and sort of difficult. So we sort of, you know, devised our own palette and, um, and sort of put together a sort of a, a lookbook effectively for the movie as we went in, as we knew we were approaching different sequences at, at different parts of the ocean, we had this sort of reference. And Blue Planet was a, a big part of sort of pulling in the ideas and those sort of references. We had a couple of questions about this particular topic, Christopher Sousa 59 on Instagram, Matt TBR on Twitter, about the process of filming the underwater world in The Little Mermaid. Now, obviously I'm assuming that there's quite a bit of CGI in there. And when you talk about like referencing things like particulates in the in the water and all these things, I mean, how much of this underwater space was physically in front of the camera and how much which CGI? I'd love to know the process. Yeah, so, you know, look, we, we knew we were doing a musical. Uh, we knew we had big, you know, sort of effectively sort of dance numbers underwater so you know we we very quickly sort of um you know moved away from any idea of doing it in any actual water because you know we we knew we couldn't move effectively our characters couldn't move we would just be hindered by just the process so um you know the idea of sort of creating these references became more important because we were handing we were we're having to sort of lean into the visual effects component pretty heavily. But what was important is that we work out, you know, the, 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 the visual sort of concept behind each of these modes, each of these sort of depths in the ocean, what's Ariel's sort of, you know, Ariel's grotto versus, you know, Triton's sort of throne room or so this sort of creating visual reference points becomes very important when you're entering a, a, a very sort of effects-heavy CGI world. And a world because, that people don't know or understand. Like, there's no real reference to the average person about what these depths look like, unless they see something like Blue Planet or scuba diving or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. People who who have those references exactly have a sort of a, 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 some idea what it, what it is to be under. But then it also depends on the ocean you're under. You know, if you're, if you're in the sort of deep Atlantic versus the Caribbean or, you know, Mediterranean, you know, these oceans are different and the level of particulates change. And so there's a, there, there is a, a lot to sort of, to sort of, you know, pull from. So we really sort of wanted to create a, that's why the idea of the sort of lookbook, creating these sort of very clear reference points for us um, before we started shooting so that we knew when we were, when we were capturing the live action elements, what we were trying, what we were hoping to achieve. And so the process of, of capturing those um, elements were, you know, there are a number of ways, you know, currently to, to do any sort of big effects, CG sort of movie. And, and in, in terms of shooting underwater, again, there's a number of different ways we could do it. You look at sort of Avatar, Way of the Water, James Cameron chose to, work with a lot of motion capture, um, facial capture. He, he shot his actors underwater um, in, those motion, in, in those sort of capture modes. You know? So he was not doing any, any real live action filming. Um, 
what what we wanted to do because it's a musical and because Rob and John DeLuca and his choreographers timing is everything. So we needed the control of the actors. You know, we we needed a live we need, you know, had to time it, had to move them into frame, out of frame, you know, they had to sort of move relative to each other in, in very specific timing. So our approach was a little more mechanical, um, where we had actors on, on effectively on the end of a crane um, in a sort of rig that could rotate, go up, down, sideways. So the actors could be moved and they were being moved by about, you know, dance a collection of dancers and stunt people who would control the motion of each of these actors um, and they were in these sort of revolving rings so they could rotate 360 and really what this allowed us to do is is really sort of be very very specific about shot composition timing um, and and we could do something like you know part of your world which is you know, each shot is timed, each each line that, that Hallie sings as she sort of, flo- you know, flies up out of frame, you know, swims out of frame or enters another frame. Everything was worked out beforehand. You know, we, you know, with Rob, when we do songs, it's a very sort of meticulous process of, um, you know, of timing and shot choice and how each each sort of, each line is performed because what we do with within the musical genre together is, you know, we rehearse these numbers very thoroughly um, so that the physicality of the song is understood by the singer before they they pre-record. Mm. So, you know, if if if, an, if Hallie is sort of surging upwards or singing or doing a particular physical motion. She knows what that is when she pre-records. So the idea of just standing behind a mic passively singing is is not, it, you know, the actors know what they're going to be doing in the song. So, so this process of sort of rehearsing, um, blocking the the song um, before the pre-record is a very important sort of part of Rob's process. But it also means then when we go into filming. Um, we have a, a very sort of structured sort of blueprint of and blocking of the actor's movement and each sort of, you know, where each line is going to be performed. And um, so it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very sort of, sort of thorough and difficult, you know, time-consuming process, but it really sort of pays off, you know, within the complexity of, of trying to, you know, shoot a performance with an actor dangling on at the end of a crane, you know, and eight people controlling their movement and another eight people controlling the other actor. And sometimes you've got 32 people just on the floor moving the actors around, you know. So it, it, it was a real dance. It was a real sort of, uh, yeah, uh, it was fun. Though. I want to talk a little bit more about that, the motion of the actors. So you, you've explained it a little bit, but I want to get it. I want to get a real clear understanding of it in my head. So you've got, I'm, it sounds like you've got people dangling off um, cables from cranes, and then you also have like you you mentioned something about putting them in like a um, a device that allows them to spin 360. Can you just explain to me like the rigging of the talent, and then also corresponding the camera? How how are you rigging your camera to capture all these moves? The approach it, it's in shooting underwater on stage is is pretty much like shooting in space, effectively. You know where there is no real horizon. Um, and you know, and and people are in constant motion. So underwater, no one's ever still, and 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 people relative to each other are always you know floating in space. And so we, so we really sort of wanted to devise a way of shooting live where our actors could float, our camera could float. Um, we could have multiple actors in a scene, and they're all floating independently of one another. Mm. Um, so the sort of yeah, so that if you can imagine a sort of like a effectively a camera crane with a sort of pedestal base on wheels with a sort of, you know, a fulcrum, one end is the actor, you know, tied into a circular ring that is on ball bearing. So it can ro- rotate 360. So the actor could effectively do a full 360 on axis. Yes. But 
being on the end of this arm means they can also be raised up and down, you know, and left to right and be pushed along on the wheel. So we had a sort of every axis of movement available to us. Couple that with our camera, which is on the end of a, a telescopic, you know, crane. Uh, we're able to then move either, you know, countering their movement or joining them in movement. So, you know, we we were then able to just sort of think of our uh, think of movement and think of the sort of dance and really sort of free ourselves up in terms of, you know, normally musical when we're working, we're on our feet, we're working on a on a flat surface and and suddenly we were like, okay, well now we can we can work vertically. You know, now she can swim upwards, you know, she can swim down, she can, you know, we can we're not sort of restrained to to feet on the ground anymore. Um, did that but, excite you or did that overwhelm? I mean, I can imagine. I think it, I think it initially it terrified us, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, you know, because Rob is a, you know, came from dance. He came from Broadway. Um, he understands putting things on its feet, you know, putting it on a stage and, and, you know, you, you exit left or you exit right. And, you know, that's how it works. But suddenly we were, you know, presented with this idea that, you could move in, in any and every direction. And how do we, firstly, how do we sort of deconstruct that and put it into a, a musical, you know, like say when part of your world and, and, and Ariel swims up to the opening and the top of her, her sort of grotto, um, you know, how do we rehearse the timing of that and, and understand how we're going to break it down? Um, so, you know, it was, it was a complicated process of of really of constructing it on its feet effectively so we would have to imagine these sort of these big moves up and you know everything we do in rehearsal i shoot on a small camera and we sort of work out the timing so at first when we were doing it with hallie on a stage just with cutouts of all her you know her what's it and things around her and um, <laughs> yeah. you know we we could sort of walk her through the timing of it and then have to imagine the big surging movements. Um, first part of the process, then we had to sort of put it into rigs and then sort of think, okay, well now she's, she's going to, she's for this, she's going to have to be on wires because our travel, she needs to travel, you know, 20 feet up. So that's not going to work on our, on our sort of, on our crane rigs for the actors because the was limited about how, how high we could raise them. So we could then break it down and figure out what rigs um, were applicable to what moment of the song that we had sort of, you know, constructed. Um, so, yeah, so it was, it was a, a really crazy dance when you imagine the sort of, you know, you know, Hallie's on a crane, we're on a crane. Sometimes, you know, you know, King Triton's in there on his crane and, and he's floating around and moving and then, add the sisters in and now we've got, you know, four or five people on cranes bobbing around. I mean, it, it, it looked ridiculous, but it's madness. You know, it's total insanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you have any reference at all in your monitors of what this world may look like, or were you purely truly just looking at green? You know, we, we started with that. There's a system called NCAM where you can, um, you know, create digital um, 3D renderings of, of the sets. John Meyer, our production designer, you know, say designed Ariel's Grotto. And then we put it into a 3D model. And with the sort of witness cameras on set, we could um, run a key and place her within the sort of, within her sort of cave. Um, and we did utilize that for, a couple of weeks as we started out, but eventually Rob was sort of just looking past that, you know, and he, he had enough confidence in imagining the sort of, the sort of pre we did and, and the visual references we created. Um, he had enough in his mind that he didn't need the live um, renderings that sort of, of, of the environments. Uh, so we we started with that system and then actually sort of um, ditched it um, a couple of weeks into shooting. Wow! Uh, and then we we're really just um, working within the blue screen world, but knowing 
you know, really because of our, you know, we had a very, very sort of intense rehearsal period. I mean, almost for me, uh, you know, I mean, COVID broke it up a little bit, but it, it was the better part of a year of prep um, starting in 2019. You know, we started prepping this project. Um, and more a lot of pre- that was more prep than any other film you've ever worked on. I, I imagine so. Uh, it, it, it yes, it, it was definitely more prep, and um, and and I and because of you know COVID hitting us a week before we we were going to go into our first oh. week of shooting, we were a week out March 2020. You know, so uh, sets built, pre lit. You know, we were the test shot. We were like literally oh ready my to go. God, that's the worst. yeah. I was so I was so like my head in the movie that. Like people like, I was like, COVID, like, what is that? Like, what's going on? Like, yeah. so like, no idea because, you know, when you're in that mode, I just blink it. Of course. And then it's like, we were like, okay, we're going to go. We're going to break for three weeks and come back. It's like sort of five months later, I think. <laughs> oh my God. Talk to me about the camera package you used for The Little Mermaid and why you chose it. Yeah, you know, I shot on the um, uh, Alexa 65. So we, you know, I, I really wanted to, and, and sort of talking with Rob, we really wanted to put this on a on a on a big canvas. Um, you know, just the world's, you know, the the world b- below the ocean, you know, is is of course a, a big canvas, but but also you know Prince Eric's world, the the sort of the the land of the world above that she so sort of you know aspires to sort of um, you know explore. We we really wanted to. Um, give that a, 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 as much of a sort of breadth and scope as we could. So I went with the sort of, um, yeah, the Alexa 65, which is sort of a, a great sort of large format um, camera system um, and combined that with um, the um, Hawk um, anamorphic lenses for the above world. But then we shot on the Leica spherical lenses for the underwater elements um, for me, sort of, um, because of the the vast amount of visual effects work, it didn't make sense for me to shoot the uh, the underwater live elements um, on anamorphics because the depth is different underwater. How we're sort of combining, you know, aerial say with um, the sort of scuttle or or Sebastian or these other little animated characters within that world meant that you know anamorphics by nature have a much you know quicker fall off and a different optical response and um and and i didn't really want to i didn't want to impose the anamorphic look on the underwater elements that we were shooting rather sort of capture them a little cleaner and be able to then impose create build the sort of optical sort of um effects you want into that world with a little more sort of freedom. A lot of the comments on the film from a cinematography standpoint is that it is dark and you guys really leaned into the realism. Personally, I didn't really think it was all that dark. Maybe I'm just used to seeing dark films, but it it felt yeah. right in line with just, you know, what your expectations are for seeing a major motion picture nowadays. I feel like people are really embracing the shadows. And I think you guys did a really good job of it. But that is one of the things that, you know, you're hearing quite a bit of. So I'd love to talk to you about that. Was that a strategy? Did that come from the Blue Planet inspiration? Um, Was it something you intended to do and why? Yeah, look, you know, I think we were sort of somewhat bracing ourselves for um, that reaction and I think mostly it, it comes largely from the fact that the reference point is an animation, you know, which is incredibly vibrant. There are no shadows in that animation. You know, you have to sort of realize, you know, this is, a, and so if, if that is your sort of reference point um, to the live action film, then it's always going to, no matter what we did, it was always going to be too dark or, or darker than people expected or darker than they remember the, the the sort of animation so you know so some of that i think was just built into you know taking on a live action sort of version of this film um but yes you know the we did look to to try and um build 
um, our worlds from a, a real world reference point. So that again, the sort of blue planet idea, taking this underwater footage, examining it, looking at it, understanding how color is affected by depth, how sort of um, you know how particulates play when you're at different depth. Um, all of these things we we wanted to infuse into it to ground it in a sort of realism, you know. Understanding, of course, that it's a story about mer people. So, you know, there's an element of, there's always an element of fantasy. But I think, you know, Rob really wanted um, Ariel's sort of journey um, and her world to feel grounded in, in a reality um, rather than pure, pure fantasy. And I think when, when you can effectively create, um, when you can, ground a sort of story like that i think it the stakes become higher you know we identify more with the journey of it you know if it's pure fantasy i just feel it's often harder for us as an audience my view to identify with that character and i think what was important for us is that the world we build you know is there to to create depth in the understanding of Ariel's sort of choices and her character and her journey. So, Also, like, what better movie in all of the live-action remakes of these Disney movies to have it be the most realistic possible? Like, Ariel is obsessed with the real world. Like, that's kind of her whole thing, is that she she's fascinated by the even the most mundane things about human life and culture. So having it leaning into realism seems to be the only way to do it. I think fantasy would have been wrong and against the storyline. Yeah. yeah. And, and exactly. And, and her, her sort of want and her sort of, you know, what's driving her is, is, you know, is, is a real sort of curiosity and, um, and a, a sort of a, a, a longing to explore something that, you know, she knows nothing about. And, and yes, I think, you know, we worked hard to, to try and sort of to, to ground that journey um, and, 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 and not make it and not try and sort of, you know, that part of the world feel like the animation. You know. Well, let's talk about the above water, uh, above water world. Um, mm -hmm. Weary Spencer on Instagram is asking, what did it take to get Italy to feel and look like the Caribbean. So first of all, good for you for shooting yeah. in Italy that whole time. I mean, yeah. what a great experience <laughs> that must have been. Not a bad that's place it. to be. That's Although the Caribbean would have been a nice place too, but yeah. not a bad yeah. place to be. Yeah, look, I tell you, after like spending like the longest, coldest winter, wettest winter in London, where we shot most of the movie, to go to like hit summer, and go to Sardinia and be on the beaches of Sardinia. It was such a sort of uh, a reward for all the, all the suffering in London. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you know, so look, um, yeah, look, you know, finding. I mean, that beach was a was a big search, you know, and and um, the Mediterranean certainly was high on our list of you know locations, you know, in terms of trying to locate somewhere in the Mediterranean because of just the logistics of moving out of London to another, you know, uh, in, in terms of the crew and everything that has, that comes with a, a movie of this scale um, to relocate. Um, so somewhere within Europe, you know, was, was going to be, we looked at Croatia, we looked at um, Greece, we looked at a number of um, sort of possibilities for beaches. Um, and, you know, in the, in the end, you know, one of the sort of, I think, things that really sort of drew us to what is now, you know, we refer to as Ariel's Beach, is the various distinct sort of rock formations that, that are in the movie. And you see them in some of the sort of posters or postcards or images from the trailer or, you know, where she lays him down on, on, the, on the sand and you have that sort of, sort of these sharp sort of conical sort of, you know, rock formations that just out um, just on the edge of the coast. And, you know, we really wanted there to be a, a sort of iconic element to her 
beach, like a instantly recognizable, you know, so every time we came back to it and, and when she's on her rock and the sort of longing she has for, you know, to being on land and the view of the castle, all these things were sort of images we really wanted to sort of reinforce and, um, and having that sort of that coved beach with those very distinct sort of um, rock formations was, was a sort of a, a key part of that decision. And then, and then, you know, Sardinia, because it was sort of within reach for us from, from London and um, you know, it, it's always a gamble when you go to an, into a, a big sort of location element of a movie like this, because we build so much control. Rob enjoys so much control in terms of what he does and how he times things. When you throw yourself on a beach in Italy, you know, you, you, for, you give up a bit of control, you know, and, um, you know, weather and, you know, believe it or not, like the surf kicking up or the wind kicking up on the beach and just all that thing as a, as a cinematographer when you're trying to sort of build the sort of continuity and consistency from day to day into sort of sequences like the sequence where she rescues him and it all takes place at dawn, you know? So now you've got these complicated sequences of people arriving. She's laying him on the beach, you know, she then has to swim out, get on her rock. She does the part of your world reprise. And it's all of these elements, you know, that, that you're building around that take place within five minutes of, of each other but you're shooting them over a number of days. And, and so always sort of fun and exciting to, you know, to, to shoot these sequences to, you know, really sort of map the light and, and understand how you're going to make all that, that feel cohesive and, and the passing of time feel, you know, understood and, and real. We've talked about filming on beaches quite a bit. I don't know. It just keeps coming up because we right. had the DP of Pachinko come on. And one of the shots he talked quite a bit about is this in the earlier episodes, this shot of the father running to go uh, grab what he thought was his drowned daughter on the beach. Um, we talked with the DP of White Lotus about filming on the beaches of Hawaii and similar things come up in that they're very difficult to know where you are. Like, be yeah, you have a horizon, but if you don't see any, any, formations you don't know where you are unless you pull back and see the shore but sometimes you don't want to show how close they are to the shore so yeah. it's interesting to hear once again this popping up because i do think that's really really important and i'm curious about the reverse perspective like you know there are shots from behind her she's on the rock formation she's looking up um that castle there was that practical at all or was that totally just added in afterwards that's to total CG, yeah. yeah. So, but but the the what we did have was the sort of the, the sort of that headland, and mm -hmm. so when we were looking for the beach, we knew we needed a place to sort of locate the castle, and that sort of relative sort of um, sort of position for her to sort of you know connect with it from the water. So you know, as we looked at beaches and scouted, we always had that in mind. So we would actually. Scouting, we would go into the water, look from the water, imagine, and that rock, we, we, we built the rock because it didn't exist where we wanted it. So we would go into the water and try and imagine distance over her shoulder to the castle. And, you know, so, but you're totally right about the sort of, these sort of visual markers that, that you sort of need in, in these sort of typically vast open locations can become a little sort of geographically confusing, even though it's sand and beach and water's that way and the beach is that way. Certain things are sort of simple to understand, but, but you know, having sort of strong sort of visual indicators that help the audience locate themselves quickly, you know, you, you don't want to spend time in these particularly emotional moments wondering where you are, you know, like where am I on the beach or is this close to the castle or not? So, you know, is this where, are we in the same place where, you know, you know, Eric washed up on the shore, you know, these things, you know, you, you want to have clear, you know, clear visual storytelling. Um, so yeah, you know, um, finding that within any location and, and, and it's not just location work. I think it can be any bit of storytelling, particularly if it's action driven, you really, really benefit from 
helping your audience understand geography. You know, where am I? Which way am I facing? You know, where is the threat coming from potentially? Or, you know, all of those things are, you know, very sort of important sort of tools when, when we're sort of telling a story um, or, or covering action. Yeah. I mean, even in my own work, I'll, because your eyes see everything beyond the monitor and you're like, I know where I am, but sometimes it takes you to really narrow in on just the frame to say, do, do we know where we are? Like, it's, it's amazing how often that can come up, especially when you're in the heat of things, you're trying to blow through pages, you're running quickly. Like, do we know where we are? It's so fundamental, but it's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Couple of things I just wanted to hit on before we wrap up. First, and this is a good question, it's from Holly's uh, Hollis Fins on Twitter wants to know which filming location was the most difficult um, in terms of environment, schedule, ability, whatever the difficulty may be. Which location was the most difficult for you? Look, it the, it, it sort of split in some ways. In some ways, the sort of we we had more, you know obstacles in a way shooting on location because you can't control everything you're doing and the weather and wind and time of day and all of those sort of elements, you know, come into play. But really the sort of the most challenging had to be the underwater elements, you know, mm. you know, just choreographing the actors, you know, trying to sort of keep the, you know, capture those live action elements to give them the life they needed and not get sort of bogged down in the technicality of it. Because, you know, Hallie is playing a, mer a mermaid on the end of a crane. You know, it's, it's tough. And yet she brings such sort of joy and sort of life and sort of, you know, into this sort of performance. And, and so really what you're trying to do, what I'm trying to do is really service that, you know, find ways to sort of to capture those, to capture her performance that is not going to be such an imposition on her, you know, because you can do anything and you can choose as difficult a path as you want, but, but you really do have to consider what it is you're trying to capture and what you're trying to achieve. And if you, and if you burden your cast too much, you know, not just will they suffer, but, you know, the whole production will suffer. So, you know, the finding ways and, and making that sort of underwater world sort of, you know, just have its own life and 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 give the actors a chance to, you know, to bring their characters to life was, I think, definitely the most challenging part. I'm shocked to hear, I'm shocked to not hear, really, any mention of the shipwreck scenes. When I watched the film, I figured, like, that has got to be the most complicated part. You're uh, yeah. assumably in a I, tank. I think I've it's, blocked it out of my, I think I've blocked it. it. See, that just, that, first of all, it's, it looked so good. And it was just yeah. so, and you had a lot of it. There was a lot of shipwreck scenes in this and just yeah. battle scenes and all of that. Um, you almost forget it because you're so dazzled by the underwater that a lot yeah. was happening on the surface of the water too. Can you talk to us a little bit about those shipwreck yeah. scenes, ship battle scenes in The Little Mermaid? Yeah, no, look, that that is up there in terms of level of difficulty for sure. You know, we, um, John Meyer, production designer, built a full-scale ship um, on a on a gimbal, and the whole thing sat up about, I think, 70, 50 to 70 feet in the air. Um, so it could completely move, you know, and roll. And, I mean, it was incredible with full mast and set. I mean, it was incredible to behold. Wow. Uh, and we built it on a, on a, on a, on a outdoor, in an outdoor tank, but where they, you know, really just for spill off. We didn't have water running alongside the boat. But what we had is sort of wave machines so we could, um, you know, they really sort of drop tanks where they sort of release the water and we could do these massive volumes of water across the deck or across the bow. And, um, and you know, we had to shoot that at night. And, of course, it was winter in London and it was absolutely freezing cold. <laughs> I mean, at one point we were shooting actually not a night scene but a day sequence with Jonah um, as sort of Prince Eric, and it, and it actually started snowing. And we're like, oh my God. this is ridiculous, you know. But, you know, they were, I mean, absolute troopers. You know, that thing about trying to protect your actors as much as you can <laughs> and your crew, mind you, but it was tough, tough uh, environment. You know, they were wet. It was freezing cold. Um, 
And once you sort of got on the boat, because it was so high up, we had to get everyone on, pull away all our supports. And once you were on it, you were stuck on it for a bit. And, you know, then the waves would come and, you know, there was nowhere to go. So we couldn't really have people helping. They had to, everyone had to get off. The actors were just, okay, here we go. And, um, you know, we shot uh, on sort of, you know, a number of, you know, big 75 foot, you know, telescopic cranes and, we had all sorts of rigs working. You know, we had the sort of, um, you know, the sort of spider cam system to sort of run the camera across the deck. And it, it, it was technically quite challenging. And then, of course, you add the, the actual shipwreck itself, which is at night. So now you take all of this into a, a night shooting with fire and waves. And, um, yeah, it, <laughs> I, I, think I, I think I did actually suppress a lot of that memory but um <laughs> it, it was it was yeah very challenging but but at the same time you know what a great opportunity to sort of play with all of that you know and 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 bring that you know have the opportunity to bring that sequence to life like that it was it was pretty fun last thing i wanted to touch on briefly and then we just have a couple rapid fire questions from our audience um mm -hmm. last thing i wanted to talk to you about is this idea that you know, for quite a bit of the film, Ariel can't speak um, and she's above water. How did that change the cinematography when you are working with a character that needs to express a lot of emotion? I mean, she's a star, but yeah. she cannot speak. Um, talk to me about the way that that impact your cinematography and how you really achieved it so that us as audience members watching, we still felt what she was feeling. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because when you... I think people forget that part, the fact that she, for half the movie, doesn't speak. Um, and, 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 if, and if you think back to the animation, the person who spoke was Sebastian. And so Sebastian is the voice of the sort of comment on everything, which is why the character is, is in the animation, is very big, sort of overly expressive, you know, sort of almost sort of cartoon character, you know, because... Sebastian is carrying the weight of the story, you know. Mm. Um, so, you know, he is the, the sort of the, the voice going forward once Ariel loses her voice. So, you know, we, we were, you know, again, in that sort of pursuit of trying to ground the storytelling and, and sort of, you know, Sebastian in our movie is, is not as sort of a big of a character. He's a, he's a, He's a smart ass and he's, he's got sort of some great lines and he's, and he's, he, he is sort of comic relief, um, but he's not as big and, 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 and doesn't sort of dominate the, the, the sort of Ariel Prince Eric relationship like he does in the animation, you know. Um, so, but interestingly, we, you know, and, you know, um, and Rob sort of worked with Lynn manuel um, and Alan Menken to create a new song for her, um, um in the movie, which is, you know, for the first time, which was a way to, for her to be, when she first comes on land, to be singing and expressing herself, but of course, in her head, so she's not actually singing. But what we found when, you know, it was actually a, a sort of funny thing, we were shooting um, the moment that Prince Eric was going to come into the room and, and sort of meet the mystery girl for the first time. And this is during the sort of at the end of for the first time um, um, for the first time song, you know, which sort of ends with Eric sort of coming in through the doors and finding her in there, and she can't speak, you know. And he says, "Well, that can't be her." But what we did, um, there's a sort of sequence in there, so she's, you know, silent. The song's playing in her head, and and we did a big lighting cue and a move around her with all the lights sort of dump out. And she, as we come around, starts to sing the song. So we sort of, we took it into fantasy for a moment for her to be able to sing and speak and express the song in words rather than just in her head and through sort of her expression. So we sort of, you know, use that technique as a way to sort of, to have her express that, those feelings, that sort of that sentiment before it sort of comes around and, and then, reality comes back and she then can no longer speak but yeah that was a cool moment i think if i remember correctly everything was in silhouette 
or everything was sort of blacked out when she, when you could yeah. see her mouth move when you're in her head. And then when we yeah. came back to reality, you can no longer see that. That was a cool moment and an interesting way to bridge from her underwater world or her, I guess her pre spell world and her post spell world. Um, yeah. But I, I'm interested in particular about did did anything change in the cinematography? Like the lensing, did you change? Did you lean more on close ups because you needed more facial expressions? Did your lighting change? How did you right. ac- how did you account for not being able to hear her or and see her mouth yeah. move? No, you, well, you're totally right in terms of you know coverage, um, you know because the sort of subtlety of her expressions, you know her, the looks from her, you know the just the eyes starting to the side, you know, looks to Sebastian or, you know, so with our words, of course, now, you know, thankfully, you know, Hallie's amazing and, and her ability to express through her face is remarkable in her eyes. You know, she's, she's um, stunning. And, but yes, you know, we definitely sort of lent into more close-ups, m- more sort of allowing her to sort of, to play those sort of silent moments with looks um, and and little expressions, um, like in the in the library with with um, you know, so the, the mo- when Eric and Ariel meet again in the library and there's a sequence together in the library, you know, we do use a lot more close up work there. Um, and for kiss the girl and you know, on the boat together again, you know, just allowing her to to you know, and for the audience to sort of really you know, understand and and not feel any sort of loss of communication effectively through the fact that she was sort of, you know, muted. Um, but yeah, you know, that, you know, so that it was really more coverage than, than a sort of change in, in lighting or, um, you know, cinematography. We, we were in our above world, so we're, we're in our sort of, you know, anamorphics, you know, in that sort of slightly shallower depth, you know, on on how we captured the close-ups. And, and that, I think, also assisted that because when you shoot long lens anamorphic and the world, you know, falls away behind, you are, as an audience, focused more on, on the face, on the expression. And, you know, we, we gave up a bit more of the, the importance of environment in those types of sequences. It does become more about your actor, the sort of those close-ups become about them, about their expression, not about, you know, the sort of place or setting necessarily. All right, a couple of rapid fire questions and then we will wrap up. First one is MM Disney 200 on Twitter. What was more fun for you to work on, under the sea or on land? <laughs> um, well, funny enough, under the sea, the song was particularly fun to work on, you know, it was incredibly complicated number to put together, you, you know, because it's we have a sort of a, a small sort of live action element in Ariel, and then we have this massive sort of CG sort of component in all the sort of sea creatures that have come to life and sort of join in this sort of song and dance number with Sebastian. But the process of sort of putting that together, you know, we worked with the Alvin Ailey, the New York dance company, came out to London, we sort of, you know, Rob and his choreographers selected the sort of, um, you know, the creatures that moved. And this, again, was the Blue Planet reference. You know, we would, you know, Rob and his choreographers would look at sort of certain creatures and how they moved and how they billowed and 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 find sort of uh, sort of parallels in dance. And then got the, we, you know, bringing the Alvin Ailey company over, they then physically brought those, sea creature movements into a sort of physical movement. And actually they were costumed in order to actually accommodate that. So we had then shot them dancing, you know, in a, on a stage and car, you know, Rob and John and his choreographers then worked out these sequences and the, the motion in order to then go back into animation and build the sequence. So it was a, you know, really sort of a, uh, a fascinating sort of process to go through and, and, and really was a lot of fun too. I'm guessing the answer to this is going to be yes, but Gia, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Gia Jazul on Twitter wants to know, did the post processing live up to what you imagined while you were shooting the film? 
Yeah, look, you know, it's 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 a massive sort of post process, and I think you you know we put a lot of work into previs and to um, you know constructing sort of building images that became reference points through the the sort of entirety of of the production. So yeah, look, I I am sort of happy with how look things. You know, you'll never get everything you want. Um, but, you know, we, we put a lot of work into trying to really sort of hone down the, you know, all the elements. And there are a lot of elements, you know, when you when you start to build out the underwater world in terms of all those things I mentioned before and depth and particulates and color and, and, and movement, um, it, it, it was a sort of complicated um, layering to sort of go through. Um, but, um, but yeah, look, I, I'm happy, you know, I'm, I'm, am I ever always completely happy? Probably not, but, but, you know, I'm never happy anyway. You know, I think we strive to sort of do things. And, <laughs> Are you and a big think, grump, Dion? <laughs> so. No, no, but, but I think, you know, I think we, we strive for perfection, but I, I don't think we ever achieve it. You know? Well, that's why the strive keeps going on. Cause you can never actually get there, but <laughs> Or over, yeah. Exactly. I have a feeling there's a lot of perfection in this film. You're just overcritical of your own work, and that is <laughs> certainly typical of the people that we have on the show and any yeah. professionals. Um, CJR3 Birth, I feel like we answered your question. He did reference the animated film. Tristan Galland, uh, could you detail the step-by-step -step prep process? We talked a lot about that. I kind of feel like we have it covered, and thank you guys so much for asking your questions. These are great questions. Um, if we don't, yeah. If we didn't get to it specifically, I kind of feel like we got around the topics in the interview. So I feel really good about the completeness of this story. And um, I think we've got some cool stuff here. Dion, I couldn't thank you more. The film is awesome. I mean, we didn't even get a chance to talk about anything else that you worked on, which is a shame because you've worked on a lot of just really fantastic films. And that just means we'll have to have you back. There you go. Yeah, we'll talk about a different genre. I love that. A huge thank you to Dion Beebe, the cinematographer for The Little Mermaid, for coming on the show and sharing his information with all of us. Uh, we really enjoyed talking with him, and I hope you did too. Let us know. Give us some feedback on all of our social media profiles. We're there on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and all of those things. And if you're listening to this episode and you're wondering, I wonder what Ben looks like. I wonder what Dion looks like. It's easy to do. All you have to do is head over to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe, and check out all of our interviews there on video. So you get a whole new aspect of these videos that you don't get when you're listening to the audio only. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And if you want to follow me, I am there at Ben Consoli, at Ben Consoli on Instagram. And wow, is there a lot going on with me. I have a brand new band called Three Second Chances. There's tons of behind the scenes and music videos that we produce. I own a video production company. I'm also, I'm always posting behind the scenes clips of the work we're doing. So there's just a lot happening on the at Ben Consoli Instagram that I think you guys would enjoy. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. <laughs>